This is ME342, the second lecture. Um, this is the first one where it gets kind of serious. Uh, the first few are kind of chatty, or the first one was just kind of a philosophical thing, but um, now we're going to get serious. Uh, so the, you've done all this. This should all be review, um, but we're going to take some loads, uh, and then from loads we're going to calculate um, what the stresses are in something, right? Um, and that's the first step in our uh, machine process. All right. Um, what are the kinds of loads? Uh, again, this is all review, axial loading. Uh, so this is just simply uh, pulling on it, right? Um, so that's a pretty common one. That's really the first one you kind of learn. And then you learn bending stresses. Um, so imagine like, uh, you know, Superman bending a bar or something like that. Um, I, I don't have my tripod right now, so I can't like flip it to camera mode. And I don't have my pool noodles down here, so... Um, anyway, but you know, so you know what a bending stress is transverse shear. Um, so that's where it, you know, up on one side, up on one side, down on the other. Uh, and then torsion, of course, is, is just twisting, right? Now, it's important to notice that these are both moments, right? Um, so this is a moment. This is also a moment, right? These are both technically moments. Um, for the purposes of this class, a torsion, uh, so the moment vector, is aligned with the shaft. Uh, and up here, um, the moment vector Uh, is um, orthogonal to the shaft. Okay, and that's, again, I'll maybe during, when I have my tripod working, maybe I'll make another uh, video just to show you what that is. Um, but these are confusing, and make sure you take a moment and look at these and um, convince yourself that you can identify all four of these, right? Um, not only identify them, but figure out what kind of loads might cause them. All right, so first one, axial load. Um, so why aren't these, whoops, whoops, that, I don't want that. Back, 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 back. Close that. Um, the axial load here, right, this is the classic one. Um, if we imagine, say this is a, you know, say we had a, like a bridge suspension cable. Bridge, or a suspension bridge cable like this so is pin loaded we call this a pin loaded like this uh, if I'm far away here right so we call this the far field right I'm far away from any threads I'm you know I'm, I'm far away from the threads here I'm far away from the, the pin loading there in this region right here this is simple Right, simple axial loading. Right, and there, so when, when I'm far away from stress raisers, the bar is straight and the load is applied at the center of the bar, I can say this, all right? Sigma equals P over A, the load over the area, all right? Obviously, if I look at these force flow lines here, so here I have high stress, Right, right there I have no stress, right, don't we wish? Um, and then we have, you know, stress in threads, right? Um, so the only place that P over A applies is right here, right? So sigma axial equals the load over the area, only there, right? So that's... What you learned in maybe statics class or, or mechanics and materials class doesn't apply everywhere, right? It just applies under these special conditions uh, when we're far away from anything interesting, right? And a big part of this class is what we do uh, in the interesting parts, right? Okay, so um, let's look at some other types of stress here. Here we have um, bending stress, right? Um, let's say I've got some big moment over here, right? Well, I've got to have something... Um, 
you know, some sort of stress or some sort of moment to counteract that, right? Uh, if, if I just left with this one here, uh, my, my bar would be spinning counterclockwise, right? So I have to have some counter moment. And so that comes up here. I, I take a bunch of axial stresses. Um, so in a, a special arrangement, of axial stresses, right? Uh, and that results in um, a moment that, that counters the, the applied moment there, right? Um, now we notice that right at the, um, at the neutral axis, there is no stress, no stress at um, the neutral axis. Right there, uh, and then the stress, the maximum stress occurs in tension at the top, and then um, in compression at the bottom. Right, and now in this case, uh, such as a rectangular beam, uh, such as an I beam or a round shaft, uh, the neutral axis is right in the center, and then the bending stresses are the same at the top and the bottom. Right, but if I had some sort of section um, that is not right symmetric. Uh, I may have different um, stresses at the top uh, versus at the bottom, right? And that's very important to know, okay? So let's look down here. Um, very important key concept, right? The bending moment is not evenly distributed over the cross section, right? So if I, if, for, the, for this class, um, we're going to work mostly with round shafts, um, So we're going to work with round shafts. So we see that there is um, no bending moment at the center. And then the maximum moments will be at the top and bottom. Okay. Um, and we calculate that with, you know, you've all seen this before, uh, MY over I or MC over I, right? Okay. Um, let's see what's next. And why is this? I wish I could see this better, but we'll figure it out for the next lecture. Um, now we're going to look at a uh, shear loading, right? Um, and this is, uh, you know, this, so there's shear at the threads. The shear on the threads here, right? And then I've got some, you know, I've got this force going to the right there, and I've got another force going to the left over here, um, and which puts this bolt in shear. And we'll learn later that that's not the right way to load a bolt, but we're not going to worry about it for now. And of course, uh, you know, you've got some load here, simply supported beam. Um, so this is the classic uh, shear diagram. Diagram um, of uh, da, 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 um, transverse shear. Right, um, and then so we've got this. Um, so you, we we can you know, using these distances here uh, and this load here, we can figure out um, that this shear diagram would look like this. Right, and it goes up. And key thing is, whenever you draw a shear diagram, generally starts at zero and ends at zero. Uh, the, a lot of people, that's a good way to check. If you're doing a shear diagram and it doesn't work out to end up at zero, you did your free body diagram wrong, right? All right, and so um, the transverse shear loading on beams and shafts, right, looks lo something like this. Um, v over IB times the integral from Y naught, that's the neutral axis, uh, to C, which is the location of YDA, right? Um, you don't really, we won't use this much. In fact, I'll even say we won't use this, right? And I'll, we'll talk about that more uh, in just a little bit. Okay. Um, so a, a few more notes on transverse shear. Okay. A lot of people, uh, so in general, so, so the, um, so let's see, tau av, 
right, is just the load um, over the area again, right? Uh, but this is way too simple. All right. Um, let's imagine that we've got some cylinder like this. And um, it's, let's say it's, it's got some load up there and some load down there. So we know there's some transverse shear, right? Um, and from this transverse shear, uh, let's take a little element. I'm going to do this little element in maybe blue here. Um, let's take this little cubicle element. Let's take that little element that's right on top. Element on top. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to draw a picture of that. I'm going to zoom in on that top element a little bit. We know it has some slightly curved surface there. And let's say it's an element that looks like that. All right, well, there's some shear on this thing, right? So I'm gonna draw that shear in red again. Uh, it seems to be pushing, uh, there's some downward shear uh, going down like that. And on the back side, there's some upward shear going like that, right? So uh, here's shear on element. Right, so this is uh, kind of, so this is a uh, force, shear force from the neighboring neighboring element, and then so over here we have another um, shear force from neighboring element okay and the problem with this is yeah I, I, there's a problem with this i'm going to put that in um green let's see how this works no nope, that didn't work at all uh let's do it in black okay so is this in equilibrium Right? Is that an equilibrium right now? And the answer is no, it's not an equilibrium, right? Because this thing would be spinning as we're looking at it uh, clockwise out of control. So in order to put this thing in equilibrium, well, let's say uh, no, it's not. So we've got to draw a new element that we're going to put in equilibrium. And so and that is kind of a square surface here, another kind of rounded surface like that and then a rounded surface like that. And we've got, um, so this is shear force from neighboring element. And um, over here we've got, whoop, that's going up like that. Another shear force from neighboring element. Uh, and to keep this in equilibrium, we'll need, this is spinning so um, let's call this net. Ah, this is what I want here. Now let's erase that. So this is uh, net clockwise rotation. All right. So to put this in equilibrium now, we need to put a couple um, counteracting ones in place. I wonder if do I have more colors available? No. Um, so I'm going to just do this in red. So I've got to have a net counterclockwise one. So I'm going to add another one that goes along the bottom here like this. So, um, counter clockwise. And then I've got to put another one up here. And for a number of reasons, it's always important. I'm going to make a note. Always draw elements in equilibrium, right? So uh, this one down here is um, the balancing uh, shear force 
from neighboring element. And of course, to keep this whole thing in equilibrium, I have to have another one. Uh, where did I draw that one in already? Yeah, I drew this one here already. And so another balancing shear force from neighboring element. Now, the very careful observer looks at this and says, okay, so there's metal to the right of it, metal to the left. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right, here I am. So, so metal to the right, metal to the left, not good, metal below. Whoa, 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 we got a problem. We got a problem. What, what kind of line does this make? So this is... Where does this come from? Right? Where does that come from? There's no metal up there, right? So without any metal up on top, we can't have this. If we don't have that, we can't have this. If we don't have that, it's not an equilibrium. So we can't have that. And then without that, we can't have that, which means this whole thing is wrong, right? So there can be no shear, no transverse shear, Uh, at the top and bottom. All right, that's a really, really important point. So I can't simply say not totally true, right? I can't simply say that that the, the shear everywhere within this cro the cross section of this of the shaft um, is just p over a. Right? Because there can't be any at the top and bottom, which means the sides must pick up the slack. Let's see how that looks. Oh, sure enough, right? Um, we know that there can be no shear We can't have tau transverse here So there must be more here, okay? Uh, so on a rectangular bar like this, it turns out um, it's about three halves of the V over A. Actually, I should change that. So the transvert, it's not an axial load, that should be a V, right? Okay. So I can't just say V over A. Um, at the top, it's zero. And then at the side, it's three halves V over A. Right? Similarly, on a circle, right? there's no shear. Uh, and at the sides, it's four thirds V over A right? to pick up the slack. Okay? Um, and since we're dealing mostly with round shafts, for a round machine, shaft, the uh, maximum transverse shear, right, and this is for transverse shear, um, it's, uh, it, it's maximum on the side, okay, relative to where the force is applied, all right. Now, notice, there's an equation here for tau max. Right. Just over the next couple lectures, let's keep a track of how many equations there are. Oh, here's another equation for tau max there, right? Tau max, three halves V over A. Tau max, four thirds V over A. What's going on, right? Uh, you're not going to get through this class by plugging numbers into equations. Uh, there's too many equations that look too much alike. So you're going to have to uh, think about what this stuff means. Okay, what about for torsional loading, right? If I'm twisting... Um, you know, twisting a piece of chalk or, or twisting a bar somehow. Um, it looks like this, this element on the side here, right? This is a pretty good picture here. Um, and we've got some positive shear on the top and bottom, negative shear on the top, on the left and right, positive being counterclockwise in this case, negative being uh, counter, um, positive being clockwise, negative being counterclockwise. Um, so that is, uh, um, 
yeah, so that's the torsional shear, right? And the equation works out to be um, TR over J, right? TR over J, so the, the, the torsional stress is the torque, and that's radius, and that's polar moment of inertia, right? The J is the polar uh, moment of inertia, right? Um, so another key concept here, the torsional shear is not evenly distributed across the cross section. Um, it's the same. Um, it's the same all the way around the surface, right? Um, but it's n not the same as we go in and out of the, you know. So, so right here at the center, there's no torsional shear stress. Out here, this is tau max, right? Um, so it becomes. Let's see. Do I have it on the next slide? Yeah, I do. Um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I didn't really, this isn't set up well. Um, so for a round bar, let's write that over here. Uh, tau max equals, let's see if it's TR over J and it's, it's TR over J here. And then J is, um, pi D to the fourth over 32. R is D over two. Um, so I think that works out to be 16t over pi d cubed, right? So just for kicks, tau max 16t over pi d cubed, tau max 4 thirds v over a, tau max 3 halves v over a. Awesome. So we've already got like three or four equations for tau max. You better not count on just using equations, right? It's not going to work out for you. Okay, so here's a quick summary. Um, the, uh, for axial tension, right? That's the easiest one. Just P over A, right? Bending stress, M Y over I, uh, I is the second area of moment, second moment of area. Um, and then J is the polar moment of area. Um, and then the transverse shear stress, uh, is determined by this funky integral here. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about on the next slide, we'll kind of sum all this stuff up. So this is for... Um, this is what we just saw, but this is for a uh, round bar, right? The max, right? So here's two more tau max, 16 T over pi D cubed. Um, and then what is this? Uh, oh, this is shear. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of them going on, right? Um, but this, the ones that we're going to use the most are these. I'm not a big fan of memorizing equations. But you're going to need these a lot. Right? So you're not going to want to have to look that up over time. 32m over pi d cubed, 16t over um, pi d cubed. Right? So for the torsional bending... and torsional. All right. Okay, so finally, holy cow. Um, let's try to apply this stuff. We've got some crankshaft here. Uh, to me, it looks like the crank maybe you'd use to, to jack up your car or maybe the, the winch on a sailboat or some sort of other of a crank handle. Maybe for, you know, maybe for like starting, um, like starting an old fashioned car, go, you know, it starts up like that. So I'm imagining this crank, uh, and then, we're, you know, we're going to get some sort of torsional action here, right? Um, and so the question is, and why are these not fitting on here very well? Um, what are the stresses? And I'm actually interested in stresses at here. Okay, I'm going to look for the stress right there. Uh, we're going to call that A. Uh, and another way to think about that is the top. Right. And then I'm also going to be interested in the stresses at B, and I'm going to call that the side. All right. But um, it's always probably good form. We better have some, uh, we should probably have some a coordinate system on here. Do you see any coordinates? I don't. I'm looking around, and I don't see any coordinate system. So let's define a coordinate system here. We'll define this uh, up here as, well, let's call up Y. Now I've painted myself into a corner. I, my 
biggest fear in life, actually I've got a lot of fears in life, but one of my biggest ones is someday I'm going to draw a left-handed coordinate system. I think we can make this X. And then, um, yep, that's X. And then if I go this way, I think that becomes positive Z, right? So now um, you have to have a, you must have a coordinate system. Because right, if you don't, the bookkeeping is just going to be impossible. All right. Uh, so we've got some sort of uh, like pushing down here. So that's pushing down. And I don't know why you're trying to start your Model T pulling on that. For some reason, I don't know why we'd pull on that. But all right, so we're pulling on it. Okay, so um, let's say the summary of stresses at point A. All right, let's let's figure out what's going on at point A. Um, do we have any axial stress at point A? Axial stress at point A. So here's point A on the top. Um, and I don't know how to, you, to just point with this thing. So here's point A. Um, is there any axial stress there? Sure, there's 5,000 newtons, right, that, that I'm pulling on the crank. will create some axial stress there. Right, I'm pretty sure that'll create some axial stress. And it is, uh, let's see. Um, so it just should be low. Yeah, axial is just load over area. So um, sigma axial at A should just be load, the axial load, which I'll, I'll use. This become, this is the Z direction. So FZ. And this is uh, Fy here. All right. Okay, so Fz, which is the pulling on it over, let's see, pi r squared, which is pi d squared over 4, right? Um, and so if I plug all the numbers in there, I think that works out to be um, 10 megapascals. Okay, bending. Bending, bending, bending. Bending at A. Is there anything that causes bending at A? Um, well, so certainly the 5,000 newtons could cause some bending. Um, except that in this case, and, and this is where I, I'm going to have to make a video and, and show you this. Um, the 5,000 newtons, the 5,000 newtons, the, the, the bending arm is the 250, goes with the 5,000, right? Um, but A is right on the neutral axis for that, right? So that's not going to cause any, um, that's not going to cause any bending from FZ, right? However, uh, FY, this thousand newtons is pushing straight down. Um, and so then point A is on the top, right? Okay. Okay. So, um, so for point A, I've got 1,000 newtons times 300, right? 1,000 newtons times 300. So M equals 1,000 newtons times um, 300 millimeters, right? And I know that sigma equals, it's 32M uh, over pi d cubed. Right, I have that memorized. Um, and that is going to work out to be uh, 196 megapascals. Wow. That's pretty interesting, I think. So if you look at the magnitudes of these forces, there's 5,000 in tension and then 1,000 pushing down, right? So the 5,000 causes an axial load. The 1,000 is pushing down. But look at the stresses, right? 10 megapascals and 196 megapascals. Um, I should also men mention that, uh, let's do that in blue here, um, note that uh, Newton per millimeter squared equals uh, megapascal, right? A thousand times a thousand is a million, right? So that gives me a megapascal. Okay, um, torsional stress at A. So is there anything causing torsion at A? Um, now, so what is torsion? What is 
spending, right? So 5,000, we already decided causes uh, a bending moment. Um, the 1,000 causes a bending moment, but it also causes a torque, right? Because there's a moment vector of, um, you know, the 1,000 times the 250, the 1,000 here times the 250 here, right? Well, that causes a torque, right? The moment vector uh, is orthogonal to both of those, which means it's parallel to the shaft, so that makes it torque. So, yeah, there's definitely a torque, so let's go back and do that one. Um, so that would be torque equals 1,000 times 1,000 newtons times 250, wait, what is it? 250 millimeters, yeah. Right, and then the tau is 16t over pi d cubed. Uh, and so that will equal, I think that works out to be 78 megapascals. All right. Um, and then finally, we've got some shear. Is there any transverse, good old-fashioned transverse shear? I heard at, you were uh, talking about yeah, something. Yeah, yeah CC, I'm talking to my students right now. Okay. Can we talk after the end? All right, CC wanted to, to check out some transverse shear. CC says, is there any transverse shear at A? Um, so our options are FZ, the 5,000 Newtons. No, nope, that only causes axial. Aha, but the 1,000 is pushing down, which means there must be something pushing up at the base of this thing at A. But we know that there can be no shear at the top, right? So no transverse shear at top. So we know that tau transverse at A equals exactly zero. All right, let's put boxes around our answers. I love having boxes around my answers. Here we go. Okay, good. Um, so sure enough, um, we've got some axial tension, or so we've got some axial normal, we've got some bending normal, and we've got some torsional shear. Uh, so that's going to look like this, right? So this is bend plus axial, and this is torsional, right? We can't have any up and down. Right, because there can be, this is a free surface here. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So we got that one figured out. Woo, this is getting long. <sighs> stress is at B, stress is at B. What do we got? Um, is there any axial stress at B? Sure there is. Sure there could be some axial stress at B. Uh, in fact, I think it's gonna be exactly the same because the axial stress is distributed evenly. Right, so same as A. Uh, so that's going to be um, 10 megapascals. So sigma A at B equals 10 megapascals. Let's put a box around that answer. Is there bending stress at B? All right, so that's the hard part. Is there bending stress at B? Um, so the thousand pounds is pushing down, um, but then B is right on the neutral axis in that sense, so there's none. Um, but then we've got the 5,000 pounds is pulling out, and so really B is, like a, is, is on the top, really, kind of relative to this, the bending moment from the 5,000 Newton force. So sure there is. And so it's 5,000 times 250. Wow, that's uh, significant. So we've got some moment equals 5,000 Newtons times 250 millimeters. And then sigma is 32M over uh, pi d cubed. So the sigma 
bending at B uh, is going to work out to be 815 megapascals. Wow. So pretty much if I'm designing things with cranks and shafts, it appears I'm, I'm a little more concerned about... Uh, a little more concerned about bending stresses so far than axial stresses. What about torsional stresses? Let's check out the torsional stress here. Is there a torsional stress at B? Um, well, the 5,000 gives a bending moment. The 1,000 gives me a torque. Torque is evenly distributed about the whole thing. So, so let's see, torque. And uh, tau torque evenly distributed. So same as uh, A, which equals uh, tau torque at B equals 78 megapascals. All right, put a box around that answer. And finally, shear. Is there just transverse shear? Let me gotta go one more over. Is there any transverse shear? Um, well, there's none due to the 5,000. So the only up-down stuff really at B is 1,000, right? And the distance doesn't matter, so it's 1,000. Um, and so that's, yeah. So that's 4 thirds. four-thirds um, V over A, uh, and so that'll work out to be three megapascals. Oh, that's interesting. Wow. So I've got transverse shear, torsional shear, bending, normal bending stresses, and normal axial stresses. So this This keeps me up at night. Right, if I'm gonna worry about something, based on what we've done so far, I'm, uh, I'm pretty much gonna worry about the bending stresses. Um, okay, so uh, just a few notes about this. Um, so the, there's some sign conventions regarding the, the what's positive torsional stress, what's negative torsional stress, what's positive shear, negative shear, positive moments, negative moments. For the most part, they don't really matter, right? Um, when we add all these things up, um, and w w when we add this stuff up, it, it, we're going to square it all, and, and so the signs don't really matter. So... Um, I'm going to just make a note here that says sign conventions for V tau V M sigma M what else uh, T uh, and then tau T not super important. Right. If we're being more mathematical about this and, and keeping track of stress tensors, right? The tensor math will will take care of all the um, all the signs. But we're kind of taking a scalar approach to this mostly, mostly pretty scalar approach. So we're not gonna we're not gonna stress that too much. Um, so that's that. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, a few notes on stress here as applied to solid mechanics versus just life in a pandemic. Um, normal stress, normal to the surface, right? And so we, normal to the surface, right? And that's designated by a sigma. Tangential shear stress um, is tangent to a surface, and that's designated by a tau. Um, normal stress acting outward is tensile. Uh, normal stress acting inward is compressive, all right? Um, SI units are, uh, whoop. Newtons per millimeter, Newtons per meter squared, that's a Pascal, right? Uh, but for this class, this will show up all the time. Uh, very convenient for uh, steel, right? So if we're dealing with the strengths of steel, everything's on the order of megapascals. 
So doing everything in newtons and millimeters squared um, is going to work out pretty well. All right, so uh, that's it for this lecture. Um, hopefully it's all review, maybe a little bit of new stuff, but uh, let me know if you have any questions. Office hours coming up.